Hello everyone, and welcome to the first video in this summer's genealogy series. The theme for summer reading this year is Tales and Tales. We have a lot of great stuff planned this summer relating to animal tales, like a program about birds and bird watching, and a bunch of animal visits and themed games to play. But obviously, this series is going to focus on the other kind of tales. The stories we tell each other for fun or to learn more about ourselves and the world around us. The Family Tales series is all about making connections with your own past. It's aimed at people who are new to genealogy or who are new to digital genealogy tools. By the end of part one, you'll be ready to start filling your own family tree and building your own collection of documents and stories. Today, we're going to discuss some genealogy basics, what it is, a brief history of it, and why someone might study it. We'll talk about the tools you need to learn more about your family's history and how the library might be able to help with that. Finally, we'll talk about an awesome tool that we just subscribed to this year, Ancestry Library. I'll show you what it is, how it's different from the personal edition, and how you can use it to help with your own research. I would like to start by saying genealogy is a very recent interest of mine. I help people use our resources all the time, and I've helped people navigate Ancestry.com before as well, but that is computers, not genealogy. There may be some of you that know way more than me about studying your family's history, and that's okay. My goal here isn't to be a genealogical expert, but to share the library's genealogy experience with you so that you can make the best use of our tools. So. Let's get started and learn our own tales. Let's start with the basics. What is genealogy? Well, it refers to someone's lineage or the line of descent traced from their ancestors, or to study that lineage. The word has a Greek origin, genea, related to descent, and ology, related to study. I learned while preparing this that the old English word for this was folktalu or folktale. Do with that information what you will, but I think it's interesting. Pretty much as long as humanity has built civilizations, there has been some need for tracing genealogy, though at first it was really just for rulers and nobles. Before written records, this relied on memory and oral tradition and mnemonic tools. You see traces of things like that in Norse sagas, which spend as much or more time talking about the character's lineage as they do on the plot. Non-Western cultures also had methods. One of the most interesting is genealogical information that may be built into Maori Tamoko. Christian scripture also places a huge importance on genealogy, tracing back characters' ancestry to Adam or Noah or Abraham. Once written records became the norm, there was a burst of popularity for publishing a ruler's genealogy and digging back as far as they could. Some of them need to be taken with a grain of salt, because with so much er because the same as with so much early history, it's more about the story than just about the facts. For example, Queen Elizabeth II's genealogy has been traced all the way back to the 9th century. But there is a family tree that traces the lineage back to Woden. You know, the god Woden. However, in a general sense, written records demythologized a lot of genealogy, because the primary goal was record keeping. Ancestry can be traced through land evidence, taxation, and lawsuits. By the end of the medieval period, there was enough written documentation that an average person could trace their ancestry but interest in genealogy really kicked off in the 20th century, especially in America. So, why should you care about genealogy? Well, to be fair, it's not something I can answer for you. It's a personal thing, and it's tied pretty closely to your relationship with your family and your own history. It's a popular hobby, and everyone is different. There are many people who study their genealogy because of some religious belief. Mormons are very interested in genealogy for this reason, and for that reason, their church has been integral in creating a lot of the resources that we use today. I know that the vital records in my hometown were preserved because of their work. 
Others may study their genealogy to help puzzle out their medical history, to find what illnesses the family has suffered from and what their causes of death have been. Educators might want to study genealogy to feel a more immediate connection to historical events they teach about. It's more interesting to think about a time period if you can think about what your however many great grandparents may have thought about it as it happened. It's also totally valid to just be curious. Do you want to see if there's anyone famous back in your ancestry or dig up some old family dirt? Genealogy is the place. For me, I'm interested in building a connection to my late grandmother and learning more about her life and the way her family lived and the way she became the, wim the woman that I knew. Regardless of what your starting goal is, this is what genealogy research is good at, connecting you and giving you a better understanding of your family and tracing your roots and who you are. So what do you need to get started? This presentation is going to focus on Ancestry Library, but you need to know that what you need is nothing, or more precisely, all you need is you. You are your first resource. You don't need any special equipment, just a pen and notebook or an open document on your computer to take notes on and answer some simple questions about your immediate family. I got this list of questions on a site called Genealogy Bank, but they're actually from a column in a paper from 1977 on the topic. In a general sense, not much has changed about the nuts and bolts of this research over time. So to start, Make note of your name and go through this list of questions. Take notes on your parents, aunts, uncles, your grandparents, including the maiden names for all of the women. Go back as far as you can from memory, leaving gaps where you're not sure. And then you have other resources. Who else in your family can you talk to about this? Your parents definitely remember things about their parents and grandparents more than you do. And your siblings and cousins also have different perspectives get what you can and see if anyone has done the research. This is what my first attempt looked like, with some important material redacted of course, because this isn't a course in how to steal your librarian's identity. So you can see first attempt, I don't have very much, which is to be fair kind of embarrassing. For example, my dad's dad died when I was an adult, but I can't remember the year. My great aunts and uncles are also a blur. I definitely met some of them as a kid, but I don't know which Bob and which Albert belongs where, that kind of thing. Doing this is actually what made me think I should probably build a family tree, right? I know so little about my family's past, even just one generation back. Regardless of my own feelings, this is a great starting place because it shows you what your questions are. It gives you an idea of who might have the answers. I know my parents can tell me about their siblings and their parents' birth dates and when they were married and their aunts and uncles. After you have figured out all the info that you can and you have your notes, that is when you can head out and start doing research. Which brings us to library resources. We have a lot of resources. To start with the basics, we've got history books. We've got computers. You can come here to get your research done if you don't have access at home. At the next level, we have our Rhode Island collection. Those are the books that are locked up in the back of the reference room. There are a lot of different resources in there, but some of our best genealogy resources are the genealogy books about important local families. There's a series on Roger Williams' descendants, and there are lists of people who served in the military during the early years of the country. Beyond that, we have the archive room, which is a mystery to a lot of people who come into the library. It's a locked, climate-controlled room full of documents from the history of Situate. We have genealogy files based on family, old maps and directories, lots of information about the reservoir, and ephemera about people who have lived in this town over time. Any of that, if you're interested, you can make an appointment and I will help you figure out what you need. But let's say you don't want my help because really you just want to know if your great grandpa was famous. That's where Ancestry Library Edition comes in. You've probably heard of Ancestry.com. This is different. 
Ancestry.com is an individualized service that you can use to build and save a family tree and connect to other people in your family. They also have DNA analysis services to match you with relatives. Ancestry Library is run by the same people but works very differently. It's an online tool to help people find genealogy resources. They have all kinds of records like the census, vital records, military records, obituaries, anything that could help you fill out your picture of your family they will have it. The only downside is that you can't have a personal profile. Everything you find, if you want to keep a copy, you have to save it on your own. They have a tool to send things to your email, or you can download files to save to a thumb drive. Basically, it has all the research power of a paid Ancestry account, but none of the personalization options. The benefit, though, is that it's available to you for the low cost of nothing. It is completely free to our patrons, or, you know, it's paid for by your tax dollars and donations because that's how libraries work, but there's no upfront cost. I'm really excited about it because it allows people who are interested in genealogy but don't have money for their own ancestry account or just don't want to pay for something like that, um, they get a one-stop shop for their research. The main the main way to access Ancestry Library is in the building. You can sign on to our computers, open a browser, and visit AncestryLibrary.com. Otherwise, on our webpage, choose Ancestry Library Edition under the Resources tab. It'll take you to a page with the link and any information you might need to get to it. You can also access it from your own laptops and mobile devices this way, as long as you're connected to our Wi-Fi. Until September 2021, as a pandemic resource, you can also get remote access to Ancestry Library. On any computer, go to situatelibrary.org, click on the same Ancestry Library Edition button, and scroll to the bottom of that page. There's information about how to get access remotely. You need a password to get it, and you can call us or email me to get that. I'm not allowed to publish it online because anyone could be watching this anywhere around the world. I want to stress that Ancestry is not built for remote access. It's an in-library service. I think it would be awesome if we could offer it to our patrons from everywhere, but Ancestry isn't interested in providing that service right now. I mention it because you may need to be patient. As I write this, remote access does not work on mobile devices. The way that the link redirects makes it send you to an error page, and I don't know why. I'm working on it, but I honestly don't know if I'll solve the problem before they take remote access away in the fall. So finally, the reason that we are all here, the tour of Ancestry Library, our new favorite free virtual service. When you sign in, this is the page that you'll see. Along the top, there is a black navigation bar. It has a series of links. Search will take you to the search page. Message boards are for posting about tricky ancestors you're trying to track down. The Learning Center has a lot of tools to teach you about the different parts of the database. Charts and Forms has family trees and other forms that you can print and use for your research. And New Collections is a list of all the most recently added documents. This main section also leads you to the search page, but in a fancy eye-catching way. And off to the right, there is a link to a, tu a tutorial showing you how to send documents you find to your email address. These are the main features, but if you continue to scroll down, it gets more helpful. Here, it shows you the most popular and useful features and how to use them. Census records will take you to the census data that's collected every 10 years from 1790 to 1940. More recent census data can be found online at archives.gov. Vital records include birth, marriage, and death records. Vital records are kept in town and city clerk's offices and are typically private record available only to the family of the person. It varies from state to state. In Rhode Island, death records become public when they're 50 years old and marriage and birth records become public when they're 100 years old. So that's what you'll find in these databases. When you research other states, the ranges might be different. Military records hold a lot of information about people who served in the military and are useful for people who are trying to figure out if their ancestors served in a particular war. 
Immigration records are extremely valuable when you're researching whichever of your ancestors first moved to the United States. And there are many more types of records on the site. It's hard to know just what you'll want or what you'll find, so I think the best way to start is just with a search. On the home page, I'll click Begin Searching. It takes me to a page asking for the name and location of the person. You can include other options and you can see at the side, you can narrow it down by special collections or search the catalogs. But for now, we'll just put in my grandfather's name and that he lived in Rhode Island. When you type their location, it'll give you examples and you should take their advice that will ensure that you're looking at the right place in the way that they have their database indexed. This is what the results page looks like. There are sliders ranging from broad to exact that give you that you can adjust to your liking. For example, actually my grandfather is a great example because his name is Norman. There are two very common ways to spell that name, with and without a D at the end. So if you have your search broad, it will pick up both spellings, as well as misspelled things, and probably nicknames like Norm. This feature is really important as you go back in time, because the further back you go, the more errors there may be in transcription, and the less likely people were to be precise about spelling, because in this day and age, we have an unprecedented level of literacy that's really quite new. Below that, you can filter even further by the type of record you're interested in. I'm not messing with the filters though. I just wanna look at my results. Those are in the main part of the screen. There are a lot of results, 1,063 documents in all. It's not a Google search level of results, but that's a good thing. The first two illustrate what sort of things you'll get really well. The first result is a social security application by Normand Roland Fanuff from West Warwick. That's not the right guy. How can I tell? Well, I didn't know my grandfather's middle name, so Roland isn't much help, but I know that he didn't die in 2004. The second result, that's the right guy. Normand Phileas Fanuff, what a wild name, but he's from Woonsocket and it's his draft card. This is the right person and that sounds really interesting, so I will click on the name of the document. That will bring you to a page like this. It lists the details from the document, gives you a way to send the doc to your email, and in some cases will let you see a scan of the original by clicking view. So let's do that. And here we see a document that my grandfather filled out when he was 18 that lists his telephone as yes, which is also wild. You can find so many little things from the past that maybe they seemed irrelevant at the time and maybe they were life changing, but now they're history. And that's basically it. That's my presentation for today. Please use Ancestry Library for your genealogy projects. It's such a cool service, and this year is sort of a trial run to see if it's worth subscribing to in the long run. So dig into your past, and you might learn something really interesting. If you want to learn more, we have more videos like this coming out throughout the month. The next one will be about putting what you find into a family tree. And later in the month, there will be one on organizing the documents you find and digitizing the ones that you have. We also have three Q&A sessions scheduled if you want to talk to me about any of our resources or if you have questions about anything we talked about in these videos. If you're interested in sharing the stories you find, I'm also booking oral history appointments the first week in August. Write up what you find or put together some notes on a story you want to share with the world. We will be posting our patron stories to our website, our podcast feed, whatever makes sense, and saving them in our archive for future researchers. If you want to get in touch with me, if you need help with Ancestry Library or any other resources, or if you want to get your genealogy research to the point where you see what we have in our archives, you can call the library at 647-5133 or email me at katherine at situatelibrary.org. 
this page of resources is for you. I'm going to publish a version of my slides without all the goofy extra art and link to them in the description of this video so you have the information and the transcript. And here are the sources I used to put this presentation together. Thank you so much for coming to this library program. I hope to see you soon.